Um, okay, so we're recording, and Dr. McCoy, I'll let you introduce yourself and tell okay. about what you're going to share. I am Harrison McCoy. I was in the mid-level certification program here about 10 or 12 years ago, and uh, got my certification here, and then came back about five years ago and finished my master's in education. And um, so I'm kept, I guess that's my tie to, to UTA, but uh, really enjoy getting to come out and, and visit with you guys about what's happening in our schools and, and the connection that we have with UTA. I teach at Arlington Collegiate High School, which is Arlington's brand new high school. We get to say that for maybe one more year until our STEM Academy opens. But we are a, an early college high school. Uh, we're in our second year, which means we have freshmen and sophomores only on our campus. Uh, we have a cohort each year of about 110 students that we uh, interview and pick uh, to be on our campus. Uh, we are targeting, and, and most early colleges do this, but, but we are targeting, uh, I guess what some people would call at the students. They are at risk of not getting to attend four-year university without some sort of early jump start. They are first-generation college students, about 98% of them. Um, we're a very uh, uh, ethnically diverse campus in that sense. Um, our students have the opportunity to graduate in four years with their high school diploma and their associate's degree from Tarrant County College. Uh, we're actually located on Tarrant County, Tarrant County College Southeast Campus. Uh, they built a building for us, uh, so we have a brand new building, and uh, we sit there on their campus. And uh, last year, our first year, our freshmen earned 10 college credits along with their high school classes. So they, uh, they came out, uh, you know, well ahead. And we have some interesting uh, relationships that are being cultivated with UTA and UNT and that really will benefit our students a lot. Uh, our students found out last week that Texas Wesleyan uh, will grant them transfer uh, student status, even though they're only going to be about 17 or 18 when they get there. And so that means that if they have at least, I think they were told if they have at least 45 hours uh, and they qualify for Pell Grant, then uh, Texas Wesleyan will basically write off the remainder of their tuition for the rest of their four-year degree. Uh, and that, we were told by Texas Wesleyan that, that that means about $22,000 a year that they'll be getting in grants uh, to complete their four-year education. So they're basically getting it for free because the first two years don't cost them a dime while they're on our campus. So it's an exciting place to be. They're not all the best, brightest kids. Uh, I think work ethic has a lot to do with them being there. And that's probably the thing they need most to be successful on our campus is just a really strong work ethic and a pretty good fix on the dream uh, to be able to see that through because uh, we're taking eight classes right now and uh, I don't know what that would translate into in a college load, but uh, two of their courses are uh, early, uh, our freshman level college classes uh, in addition to their high school classes. So it's a pretty busy, pretty, pretty busy campus. Um, and it's just fun to be here. So we're talking today about globally, being a globally connected classroom. And uh, just a couple of thoughts here. give me a reason to want to be a globally connected teacher and to have a globally connected classroom. Um, I'm going to give a, just a very, very close to home example of sharing this with Dr. Simmons a few moments ago. I teach computer information applications, which can be kind of a boring class in some ways because we're awfully tied to teaching Microsoft. In, in a sense, that's what I am as a shill for Microsoft. But um, <laughs> Uh, we do get to teach computer hardware and operating systems. We do teach uh, digital literacy, digital citizenship, 
but probably, I'm going to say half the year is spent teaching Word, PowerPoint, Access, and Power, and, and uh, Word, Access, PowerPoint, and Excel. Excel. Yeah. And um, if you're 14 years old, you know, and you've already come through what our Arlington students do in the eighth grade, which is a course called CTHEI, which takes technology and career and puts all that together in one class. They should be coming to me with a pretty good base in Microsoft Office. Um, not all of them do because they're eighth graders. But uh, my course, I think, challenges me as a teacher to really make it meaningful and not just another technology class to get through. And so I've been working this year to try to bring inquiry-based learning into that coursework. And that's a real challenge because I don't know anyone personally who's doing that. I'm not saying they aren't. I just am having trouble finding research and data and good, strong assistance to help bring inquiry-based learning into that kind of coursework and that kind of curriculum. And so I took today off partly to be here, but partly just to spend some time thinking through what I do. And, and, and I've been involved in that research process this morning. And so I was telling Dr. Simmons that because I think global, globally, she asked, what do your colleagues think about that? Well, I didn't automatically think of the teachers that I teach with. I thought of the teachers that I contacted just before I walked in the room here, who teach in Singapore and Mumbai and Kathmandu and Sydney, Australia and Beirut, who are people that I consider up the food chain for me in terms of technology education. And I just kind of put it out there to them. What do you guys think about this? What have you read? What are you hear? And literally, you know, the message it, it went far beyond people on my campus. And that's not to say that I couldn't talk to the teachers that I work with, but I'm looking for other tech teachers who struggle with that, not science teachers who I think have the easiest job in the world when it comes to inquiry-based learning. I want someone who struggled my struggle. And so because of global connectedness, I wasn't limited to the people that I work with in my, in my campus and even in my district. And that translates in my classroom into opening those same kind of doors for my students. Because I want them to feel like that's not just a teacher thing. I want them to know that being globally connected has benefits for students as well. So, as we think through that, um, I want you to think about this graphic here. You can, you can see it. And when I say the internet of people, you know what I mean? We, we talk about the internet, and a few years ago, someone coined the phrase the internet of things, because so many things are all connected. But there's an internet of people, too. And that's what being globally minded means, is learning how to connect and share regularly and, and globally minded teachers and bring that dynamic into the classroom so that literally there is a, a, an internet of people going on as well. I have a friend who uh, works with a concept called Genius Hour that you probably heard of 20% time where uh, he actually calls it innovation, he teaches an innovation class. And if you're not familiar with that, there's three terms I just gave you that you can Google real quickly and find out about it. But one of the things that they did on their campus was they created a genius bank. And this was in an elementary school. So they really brought it down to a very basic level. But they asked every student who was old enough to write and read to participate in this genius bank, where the kids got to answer questions like, what do you see yourself as being really good at? What do you enjoy doing? And they were trying to get the kids to kind of tap into that inner sense of, of this is my inner genius. No matter what Mensa says, I'm a genius if I can do this and I can do it really well. And then they took that genius thing and imagined that if you're working in class, now let's bring it up to my ninth grade level. My ninth graders have a project to do in chemistry. And 
they don't know how to do something. But they know, because of the genius thing, that Muhammad over here and Daisy are in the genius bank under this particular topic in chemistry, and they can connect with those two students who they really don't see very often or they don't really connect with on a day-to-day -day friendship basis, but they know that the genius they have can help them accomplish what they need to for their course. And that internet of people comes into play. And then, of course, you just take that and, and you know, extrapolate that around the world, and that's what we're talking about, global. So global teachers bring that sense of connection and sharing regularly with other people into their classroom. Did you make that term up? What? Internet of people. I haven't heard anyone say it. So <laughs> that's awesome. It okay, <laughs> that's a great term. You know, I, I've had yeah, okay. like I said, the internet of things, and then I began to think about the people. Now, five tools that I use pretty regularly in the classroom. Um, one of those is Twitter. Uh, I heard someone say, do you tweet? Someone said no. Um, I've been involved with Twitter probably going on about two years. And I probably should get a new picture, but I really like that one. It reminds me of summertime. It's one of my favorite summer pictures. But um, I don't tweet. I didn't get involved with Twitter for a long time because I really didn't care what Brad Pitt had for breakfast today. And I really don't care what anybody else had for breakfast today. So I wanted, and, and I got started with Twitter because I met someone who used it to connect with other educators. And I thought, well, that really makes sense. Now, the, the sidebar of that story is she was a specialist in our district, and she was assigned to my campus for technology, as a technology specialist, and I could never reach her. Never. But I found out she was on Twitter, and I discovered the way to reach her mm. was to get on her Twitter. Mm. And she never read emails, as far as I could tell. And it was really difficult to reach on the phone. But by golly, I you know, started tweeting her, and we became best buds, and I never had that problem again. So that was my initiation to Twitter. But since that time, and that's the only thing I really use it for, is for education connections. And so the people that I follow and the people who follow me, now I can't count the, the stray people who just randomly follow me. You're involved in Twitter, you know, all the time. You get businesses and vendors and things like that. But, but, but my goal there really is essentially just to connect with people on Twitter and who, who can help me become a better teacher. And that's, that's the whole reason that I'm on So Twitter is a tool. Um, another tool that I use, uh, and my students use this just uh, a couple of weeks ago with a project, it's actually an, an application called appear.in. Anybody ever heard of that one? No. Um, what appear.in does, it lets you, I, I could go here right now and create a video conference with mm. up to eight people on the screen at a time. Just by sending them, I would click on the link and you see it's just kind of randomly coming mm. right there. Uncovered dinosaur, diligent, land. Uh, you can type in your own room name playing that room, but basically what this application does is it, we can do instant video conferences by claiming the room and then sending the room out to people. And we recently, my students a few weeks ago participated in a global uh, ed camp day, and one of the things that one of my groups did is they, they led a global discussion on plagiarism and copyright. This is ninth graders who sat there with the and my students moderated the discussion, and we had at any given time a full screen of eight people from all over the world, other students, talking with each other about copyright and digital citizenship. Mm -hmm. And this was just a tool that we used, and all they had to do was make that, we created a link, and we put that out, tweeted it on the conference website, and people could have that link and then they could run it. Can you do it anonymously where they don't see your face? Do you have like an avatar on that one, or do they have to see your face? Since it's a, based on a webcam, I'm not sure you can, but I, okay. you could probably turn it off. Yeah. Looking for anonymous, so. so that's a peer dot in. That's a, you could turn that's off your tool. video. Um, Maybe. Probably have heard of Kahoot. Oh, yeah. Um, Kahoot's kind of fun. Uh, basically, it's typically it's thought of as a formative assessment tool, but it's basically just a uh, uh, 
a game platform that a lot of teachers use. Uh, you can actually play this one worldwide at the same time. Anyone who has the Kahoot the game code can join the game, and you can compete against, against each other from mm. all over the world. And uh, we use that to and, and to build relationships relationships with some students and other schools. Um, Skype in the classroom. Uh, Skype is not new, and uh, certainly, you know, but, but, but I think the idea that Skype has an education platform is kind of interesting, and mystery Skypes are awful fun, especially in the lower grades, where you Skype into someone else's classroom, and the kids there have to ask them questions to try to guess where you, it's like 20 questions on steroids, <laughs> and, and they try to guess where I am, and, you know, based on the questions that they ask me the answers I get. Of course, I try to hide the Dallas Cowboy logos. <laughs> it would be really direct for us there. And the last one that I've got on here is uh, something that you can actually become a part of called the Global uh, Education Conference. Um, it's a community of educators worldwide that uh, basically promotes globalization in the classroom and uh, connectedness with teachers around the world. It's just a, really is kind of an impressive group, and they do a lot of conferences that you can participate in as well. So those are five tools that I use. And I was just curious if anyone responded yet to what I put out this morning. So those are the five tools that my students have used. Now, uh, the second, I think, characteristic of a global teacher is that they have learned how to flatten the learning. And by that, I simply mean taking the walls down and making learning possible anywhere, anytime, within the world. I walked through uh, Blue Bonnet, Baldwin area just a few moments ago, coming over from where I parked on the other side of the campus. And, um, and it was really fun. I walked into that area right outside Blue Bonnet, Baldwin, and there were probably 25 students sitting there in all these comfortable chairs. Every one of them had earbuds on. Mm -hmm. Every one of them was connected to something. Mm -hmm. Some of them might have even been learning. But out of all the students there, I think I counted about 25 students. Only one was sleeping. The rest of them were connected to something. And some of them probably were learning. The idea that we flatten the learning process and make it possible to learn anywhere, anytime, with anyone is a growing notion in education. Um, this website, Flat Connections, uh, Julie Lindsay, is she got, she's just one of the pioneers in this area as far as a, a worldwide emphasis on this. And uh, she, this is what she does. This is her, her role as a consultant and, and tech uh, theorist to be able to, to develop the idea of flat connections. And uh, that's kind of, she's got a great website there. Third, um, to develop a sense of global curiosity. Um, I thought I had kind of put this term in education for the first time, but I didn't, it turns out. But I'm going to use the term localization, not globalization. Um, localization actually is, is a, a term that came, kind of came to prominence back in the 1980s when, gosh, some of were not even born yet. Um, but McDonald's is, is usually seen as a really great example of localization. The idea of a global perspective on things with a localized presence. So you would go to McDonald's in every country in the world where they exist, and it was interesting, um, a friend of mine who, who was in uh, Nepal sent me a picture the other day of a McDonald's that had a sign that said, no beef sold here. Now, we have trouble thinking about a McDonald's. If they didn't sell beef, we'd wonder what they were putting in the bags, okay? And we might not want them. But of course, in that part of, the, of Asia, you know, that's a big issue. So McDonald's had to overcome that. I remember the first time I ever heard of anything like this was way back in the 70s, uh, when Esso, remember Esso Gas Company, became Exxon. And they found the reason that I was told back then, I haven't researched it, but I was told back then that the reason that they changed their name from Esso to Exxon which involved going from two S's to two X's, was 
that the word ESO in, in some Middle Eastern cultures had a very derogatory meaning. And, and it was about the time that the Middle East oil crisis and everything was going on in the 70s. And so Exxon faced a major corporate challenge, identity challenge. In order to be local, they had to change their presence. And they chose, chose to change their presence worldwide. But localization basically says in the classroom that my feet are firmly planted at 22, 24 Southeast Parkway in Arlington, Texas. But my mind takes into account all of the cultures that are in my classroom, and it takes into account all of the cultures that I could possibly connect my heads with in order to expand their world. Most of my students, many of my students, have never really been out of life. We took a group of 10th graders a couple of months ago to uh, San Marcos, and you would have thought we were going to the moon. <laughs> uh, they had never oh. seen a Bucky's before. <laughs> wow. Oh my god. Gotta see a Bucky's. You know, Bucky's was the treat. We saw it going down there. We had, you know, it became the carrot on the stick for good behavior on the way back just to get to go to, to see that place. So anything I can do to expand their world and the connections that they have. But localization is, is kind of a key term there to understand. Local teachers seek out ways to collaborate. Um, kind of already spilled that one out this morning, thinking about the people that I went to talk to, but I think intentionality is the word that I'd like to add to that here. It doesn't happen by accident. That you set your class up and you set yourself up deliberately to connect and to look for ways to collaborate. When I start a new unit, I think about the people that I connect with on Twitter and who can be a resource for my students. And so we have, and we'll look at this in just a moment, we have a young woman who runs a, a think tank for Irish entrepreneurs speak to my class about business practices. And she Skypes into the classroom and talks to them and entertains their questions. And, 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 and listens to their jokes and, and problem solves with them about what they do. And they get to talk to someone from Ireland to do that. Um, this year, our guest is going to be a young 18 year old entrepreneur from New Zealand when we do that unit. 18 years old, he started a company when he was 17, an import export business in New Zealand because he, he looked around and saw that people had trouble buying computer parts hardware in New Zealand. And so as a 17 year old, he began to buy things and, and resell them on the website. And that thing just kind of snowballed into now. He's actually a millionaire as, at 18 with his own company, a global company based in New Zealand. And so he's gonna be, be talking, my kids are gonna get to learn from him. What is a 60 year old guy like me who's never been in his own business, in his own business and his wife know about entrepreneurship? Put an 18 year old who's making a million bucks a year in front of them, and I think that's going to get their attention. Now, how did you how do you make these contacts? Is um, it through the <clears throat> digital? Well, you know, okay. I, I read what's on Twitter, mm -hmm. and I happened to see him one day. He, he it was a retweet from someone who I I did follow, and I was so intrigued by something that was going on there that I, I clicked on his feed and began to look at his website and. And one thing, just she introduced me to him on Twitter and, and just kind of established into a relationship. Okay. So, um, I mentioned Julie Lindsay earlier. She's developed a taxonomy for doing this, which is kind of, I think, uh, should be, helps bring this into higher ed. Because I know, I mean, you know, high school, we don't maybe worry so much quite about taxonomy, but, but I learned when I did my work here that that's a key word. You need to know about taxonomies. So she did a great job developing a taxonomy for global connection in the classroom. And uh, you know, beginning with an introduction, basically connecting the members of your own class with each other. Okay? Moving up to interconnection within the same school or within the same district. Moving out to begin to have managed global connections. And this is about where we are right now in my classroom because I'm still kind of running the show. However, 
uh, last year, and when I was still teaching eighth grade at the junior high, we decided to set up a, a relationship with a, a British, uh, it's a British school in Kathmandu, Nepal. And uh, we wanted to get the teacher there that I was working with, we wanted to get our kids together, but they're 12 hours apart. Oh, yeah. And so how do we do that? So my eighth graders came up with the idea, let's do a night school. It'll be daytime where they are, Dr. McCoy. And if the principal will let us, we'll, we'll do a lock-in. And it started to grow from night school to a lock-in to a party <laughs> overnight in the school building all along. And the, uh, <laughs> so I was getting ready to be locked in with 24 inch rooms. Wow. Principal said, whoa. And I was like, thank you. So, but he did give us the block of time from 6 until 10. And so the kids, some of them came back at 6. A lot of them just got home out after school until 6 o'clock, and we all met in my room for pizza, and, and we did some other things and kind of waited. And about 8.30, when school started in Kathmandu, we were able to connect by Google Hangout with the classroom over there. And we began to play games with each other, and, and they had done an assignment ahead of time that they shared, and so they were able to complete the assignment together uh, on, on the Google Hangout. And after about 10 minutes, I promise you, you guys won't be surprised at all. I looked around, and my kids were no longer looking at the laptops, doing what they were doing. They had just switched over to their personal devices, to their phones, mm -hmm. and now they were on Instagram with the kids in Canada. Mm -hmm. And it took off from, from my technology to theirs, and some of them still correspond with people and the friends that they made in Canada in that, in that experience. So in some sense, we have moved up a little bit in the taxonomy there with some of my students. But structurally, this is about where I am in my classroom right now. But it does lead on up to student to student with teacher management, and finally, student to student with student management. We came close here with uh, the, the groups that were doing the uh, web conferences a couple of weeks ago because they really took off and they really ran that. I was kind of monitoring the whole room because I had, had three different groups going at the same time with three different subjects that, that they had going on in that conference. So, uh, I just wanted to show you just a quick... Oh, do you know how to do it? <laughs> Oh, yeah, click on, yeah, there you go. So this was just to kind of show you what went on. Right. Um, well, uh, I see marketing, actually marketing for me, uh, it starts always uh, with the customer. So you have to really have a great understanding of a persona. So like answering the back the uh, every media that you like, like blog, for example, like blog about your uh, potential customer, and you're trying to really understand about the lifestyle and Eastern they Eastern like Eastern. your mm -hmm. current customer. And then when you have that, then you choose, okay, so like what was the best way, what's the quickest way uh, for me to reach my customer? Should I create a blog, or should I create a video, or should I actually not even necessarily you have to do online, you can do offline. So, so like if you have a product for a student, maybe the, the easiest way for you will be uh, to reach him actually just personally, just go to schools, go to universities, right? Uh, do some other... So that was the, our entrepreneur week that we did last week. And then, um, she supplemented what we did. Now this is the, these two guys were doing one of the conferences on appear.in. Uh, this will kind of show you that's what the screen looked like with the other students. And so they were actually managing and moderating the conference for our classroom. Yes. And so they were Canada. In Australia, most of the kids who were participating in that that day. Uh, we're getting ready to do, or we are in the midst of uh, something that, that I'm calling this year the experience. 
um, where the kids are all creating something uh, based on what they've learned in my class so far this year. We've got a video production team, uh, a computer science team that's learning how to code websites. Uh, we've got another group that's doing digital storybook publishing. And then another group that's just doing scientific research. And the idea is they're creating something on May 17th. They're going to share in uh, Global Maker Day, which is a, a video conference where they'll be sharing what they've done the last two weeks in my classroom. And they have a time slot that they're responsible for filling that time on, on a live broadcast about what they did there. So that's the kind of a shared image, which brings us kind of number five, which is using technology to bring people together. Uh, this is something I'm kind of kind of proud of. We're able to do this this year in Dr. Simmons, and this is going to be my first ever webinar. Oh, cool. Email. But uh, uh, we wanted to promote global classrooms. And um, uh, as a part of that global education conference that I mentioned earlier, they're doing a global leadership week in April. And I kind of launched out to take a session there and be responsible for the content. And so I'm creating a webinar, and I invited some friends to participate in the webinar with me, and we're going to be talking about how can teachers who have no experience whatsoever, how can they put their class on the track to become globally connected. And so uh, Toby Carr is the young guy from New Zealand that I said uh, that I was talking about earlier. He's going to participate in that. Jennifer Williams has a company in that's Florida-based called Calliope Learning that uh, she does a consulting in that role. And then uh, Justin is a teacher in Virginia who's just very, very globally minded. And so he's kind of the, uh, the teacher representative. We've got an ed tech consultant and an entrepreneur. From the student perspective, and I'm kind of bringing the moderator role to that. But uh, so we're going to do that and um, uh, see how that goes. We're, Toby agreed it's, uh, I think, 16 hours difference wow. for us in New Zealand. And so he's, uh, you know, almost tomorrow night when we get to that place. <laughs> wow. So he's uh, kind of making himself available at a really weird time schedule to be a part of that. So uh, this is the next thing that we have going on. And uh, my students will kind of be involved in some of the prep work on that. So uh, we participate in things like EdCamp Global, uh, which uh, takes place in the summertime. It connects teachers from around the world uh, in an EdCamp format that's online. And it was, uh, Ed Camp Global was uh, a 24 hour global Ed Camp, basically. And there was something going on. That evolved into Ed Camp Global for classrooms. Uh, after the Ed Camp Global last summer, I suggested, you know, wouldn't it be great to do something like this for kids? And if you're familiar with the Ed Camp concept, uh, on my campus this year, we're doing a, it's called a Stu Camp. So we're bringing the Ed Camp model camp. to wow. our students. That's as awesome. a, uh, uh, we're going to use it as a final Second exam camp. prep that, where the kids get to come in and ed camp format and help with what they need to get help with. Well, I, I said, wouldn't it be great to do a, a, a global ed camp for students? And some people kind of took that idea and ran with it. And we ended up with uh, a 24-hour block of time, 24 time zones, and we had kids from all over the world that were participating in that, and they had uh, taken a time slot and the guys who were at the computer doing the, the talk on, on visual learning, uh, that's what they were participating in that day. So uh, global classrooms. And then the, the, the trilogy is complete this May with Global Maker Day, which is a <laughs> maker space and creating and sharing what you create in a global sense. So uh, these are the things that, that we're kind of involved with in my classroom. And, uh, you know, it's it really is, I just think it's so important to bring students to the place that their world is bigger. And it makes a huge difference in how I look at my classroom and how, how I look at what I do. Every day really is something. And I don't get more teaching than I do when I, when I kind of bring it out to that global sense. And I'm not isolated and uh, tremendous levels of support that teachers get when they, when they reach out and develop those kinds of relationships. So, um, I fully expect that not everyone that I contacted this morning will help me with my predicament about inquiry based learning, but I guarantee you I'm going to get some help on that. And it will make a difference in how I approach that. That's awesome. Well, good. Well, Thank applause. You. For, what, what ideas do you have or what sparked 
in your mind while you were listening. I'll just add, um, you really have to think outside the box with this kind of teaching, right? Um, so like step one is like have an open mind <laughs> to possibilities because there's things I've done that if you told me five years ago I'd be doing it, I would be like, what? No, that's impossible. Or, but you know, this is in my right. So you, it's out of the box. Um, I've taught ESL to students in Siberia through um, WebEx, which is a video conferencing system. So I would say video conferencing skills are really crucial. Um, even something simple as Skype. Um, just do video conferencing, even if you're just connecting to a relative or something to get that practice. Sometimes Dana and I practice just to try new tools out. So practicing before you teach is really key. So you're at least one little step ahead of people. Be extremely flexible. I was doing a webinar with you a couple mm -hmm. months ago. Mm -hmm. Best laid plans. I had a commitment that morning to go to play practice at church. And uh, I took everything with me that I would need in case I got bogged down and didn't get back to the house in time for the webinar. I thought at least I could can plug in at a Starbucks and do it from there. I got home and my wife had gone shopping and I was locked out of the house because I'd gotten a ride back home and I didn't have any keys to get in. I could get into the garage and I thought, well, then I can get into the house, but then someone would lock the door between the garage and the, the wireless will project out there. Just uh, exactly. The <laughs> that is exactly what happened. I literally just stacked up some boxes, made a platform there. My wireless was directly on the other side of the wall, so I had a good break signal. And you know, I did it from there inside the garage. I'm here in my office. And, uh, it was, it was a <laughs> it worked. You can see the taping and bedding on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it worked. Went right through with it. It, it worked. Yeah. Possible. That's true. Yeah. A lot of, the, the thing that you run into is that time difference. Yeah. yeah that 16 hour time difference. I know I had a friend that did a, uh, this was back in the H3 or H.323 video conferencing days, which is when you had the big fancy rooms with the video conferencing equipment. And they were connecting with uh, a New Zealand classroom, middle school, and they were doing science experiments together. So they were like, I don't even know what the experiment was, but it had something to do with the weather. And so they were like checking in. And so they had to check in with each other every day. But it was literally the end of the day at the New Zealand class school, and it was the very beginning of the day. Of the, I mean, it had it was like six o'clock in the morning or something. I mean, it was the way they were doing it was it was crazy, and uh, they did it for several weeks where they were connecting back and forth all the time through this one classroom. So, I want to incorporate it into my uh, multiple teaching practices, my last course. I'm not sure if we'll get to it this semester, but um, when we talk about we spend the second half of the course talking about PBL, and I think it would fit pretty naturally with that to have some kind of international component. I visited the teacher that teaches it in uh, the same course at UTD, and she has some uh, international component to her classroom. There's one more thing that I could teach them that they could incorporate into a, into a project. The social media cool. day, connecting with people in other countries is maybe five minutes mm -hmm. to connect with somebody where you know, 10, 15 years ago. So I would be trying to find colleges of education that had similar programs like ours that we could do a project, the same project, and discuss it. And there are there are international Twitter chats that go on on a regular basis. There's one called uh, hashtag What is School? What is School? But, but it's uh, it's one of the largest groups of international educators that gets together. I think they're on Wednesdays about four or five o'clock our time, and uh, I know it's. While I'm driving home, so I never get to, to be there unless I'm off. Um, but, but it's a, a real dynamic group of educators from around the world that take on different discussion issues. So. How do you guarantee that if you're teaching the same class over multiple class periods, how do you guarantee that every class is getting the same experience? That, like, this class where the first class is talking to New Zealand, what happens for your other three classes? I try to rotate it around and pick people in different time zones. Um, so that you mm. get to experience it eventually. Uh, for example, when Toby speaks from New Zealand uh, on our Entrepreneur Day, you know, 
he'll get to speak live to one class. Everybody else is going to get to put it down on the recorded video. And then the next time we do something, I'll plan it with someone who's in a time zone that is more for one of my afternoon classes. Mm. So just try to strategic. I, I am sensitive to that, but, but you just there's there's no way to do it back to back to back to back. back, 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 back. So. And then you can always record it, probably if yeah. with permission, you could probably record some of that. Yeah. So I don't know. That's good. Any other thoughts or possibilities? I also had pre-service teachers like y'all chat through Edmodo um, in Australia. So it was asynchronous. And so I knew a professor who I'd met at a conference. We just were hanging out in the coffee area. And so we decided to do kind of a, this, you know, chat through Edmodo. And so it was really the cultural differences were the most interesting part of it, right? Because we were very Texas and they were very Australia. And so even though we had similarities, it was really interesting to see the cultural differences. So that's what I liked about it. I just liked the cultural. I mean, even though Australia is like English speaking, it's still very diverse and different. They have different viewpoints on becoming a teacher. And it's interesting. And, it's really interesting to get to know you know, how the educational process, how, how teachers view their jobs. Mm -hmm. um, some of them work under tremendous hardship compared to us. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness, most of our teachers would, they'd see their world so much differently if they get to know a teacher who's teaching in the Middle East or, or in Asia mm -hmm. under the conditions that they, that they have to teach on mm -hmm. to do what they do. And uh, salary alone, even if you factor in standard living, cost of living, uh, gosh, we're so well paid compared to probably half the world at least. So it's good perspective. Anybody else have questions? How typical is the global classroom in in different districts, like let's say Arlington? Do you know other people who do these kinds of things? There probably are a couple of people. Yeah, that I know that I okay. Um, I wouldn't say it's really caught on. Mm. You know, it's a district-wide issue. Yeah, okay, gotcha. Yeah, because it's out of the box. <laughs> um, I would think this would be really good for foreign language learning, especially, I would think. That's how it's used here. That uh, The same person I know that where I do, I've done ESL also uh, connects with the Russian courses here. One of the Russian professors connects with them, so they learn e Russian, and then we're teaching them English. That's kind of, it has to be reciprocal, I think. So I think that's the key: is, is building the relationships that let you have that reciprocal. Work. Right, you're not just taking; you're giving. So bring something to the table. Any other thoughts, y'all? How can we learn more? Just get on Twitter. I think that's <laughs> right. You know, yeah. Um, one, one thing I have a problem with Twitter is I'll like a bunch of these places or whatever, and then I'll try to start following, and it just snowballs into, you know, scrolling, 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 and then Twitter will add some more in there. Here, try this, try this, and eventually I'm just like, ah, and I just give up. It's a, it's a little like trying to drink out of the fire. Right? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. once you get past a certain point, the feed becomes so large. And on your list, when you click on the list, does the list just feed those <laughs> sites that you've added to it? Well, I think I, I have one list. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, and that's what I would recommend doing is, is <laughs> starting to learn how to manage lists and then go to, uh, this is a tool that I just love. It's um, called Tweet Deck. I got that. That's all I use. Um, I still had not figured out how to make it work. When I have a chance to, to use Tweet Deck on the, I mean, the Twitter on the PC. I need to do that too. I don't know where it is. What Tweet Deck allows you to do is manage multiple chat themes at the same time. And we used Twitter in my class last week. My kids were all doing a discussion group on their projects. And I had four for each project. I had a separate hashtag discussion group. So with with TweetDeck, I had four columns on the screen constantly watching what the students were saying in all four groups at once. So what I can do with and, and these are my student groups hashtags. By the way, this is what they were doing. But if I had a group, say uh, 
what is school, an international group. I could just have that one on TweetDeck as a feed, and the only thing I would see is what those teachers who are hashtagging that conference see. And I can, can take a list of, of people as well, and I can follow someone or groups of people on TweetDeck, and so it brings it down to a more manageable focus uh, with a tool like this. So if you had like the whole class doing it, but then you had them divided in three groups, you could have one hashtag for one group, yes, one hashtag for another, and then that's you, exactly could, what this you could watch their progress as they're working. I had C hashtag CIA experience one, two, three, and four, and they were only supposed to post to their hashtag, which is tied to their project, and so I could and I will be going through here reading all of their comments and part of the assignment was to contribute to the discussion so I needed to put a very good which students did. We were having them post things that are relevant to their project? Yes. And they, could, they could ask questions so that the students in the other class periods who had the same project uh, could, could offer insight or advice or they could just comment on what they were doing and talk about what they were learning. Or they could respond to someone else's post. Tweet that used to be an independent company from Twitter. And so they had a mobile app too. And then Twitter bought them and made it pretty much just a Chrome extension for the website now. Is there an app? Is there an iPad app? Oh. There's just a Twitter app now. See, they, they killed the Tweet Deck. I've never used Tweet Deck on, on the iPad. There's one called uh, Boot Suite. Boot Suite. I've heard of that. I've had, I just opened up the other day to look at and play with a little bit to see how I like that on the iPad. I tend to, to use all three of my kinds of devices as far as that goes for it, but, uh, but when I'm on the PC, I usually open it up and it a little bit just because I'm following different groups of people at any given time. Here. But this was an interesting experience. My kids have not done this before. This was their first time. You would have this up in class so they could see the, the feed. Yes, it was on the projector feed from the end, so they could see it. And and I actually publicized it on my Twitter and had several teachers drop in and, and contribute to the discussion as well who followed me. Mm -hmm. And I asked them to do that so the kids would kind of have this sense of hey, this is out there for the whole world to see. Did they like so that? They were it was mixed emotions about that. Mm -hmm. It made them much more aware of what they were saying, mm -hmm. which is was the whole point. Was, was the accountability of that? It was, yeah, <laughs> and, and it, it was not stopping in the room. And that was, you know, when one of their former teachers from junior high jumped into the discussion. Oh well. Oh, that was she was real too. I mean, it wasn't like a stranger. It was suddenly this photo from eighth grade at Barnett Junior High School was listening to what I'm doing here. So. This was a big reality check for them as far as the work that they were doing. Could you make a list and for each for a class, like a list called six period, and everyone that was in six period should have the Twitter, and then you could follow and see things. everything that you they could see that one class. class. Mm. Yep. And see, you know, from a just from a professional Easy. standpoint, I don't follow any of my students. But a couple would follow me, but you know, mine is pretty boring, <laughs> so they don't stick with me long. But I do not follow my students. Mm. That level, you know, grade, I would, if I taught in college, mm. if you don't follow them, you can't direct message. Yeah. So that's so, a good mm. security. It's just an accountability for me. That's click that add column button, Pearson, so that you can kind of see, because if you click the add column, it's right under, yeah. right there, click that. That's all the columns you can make. Mm. So TweetDeck has so many, so flexible that you can kind of control what you see and what you don't see. Oh, good. Once you get to the place where, it, I think the messaging thing is pretty cool because, but in order to message someone, direct message them, they have to follow you, you have to follow them. And so this morning when I sent out that plea for help on my project, that I, on, I didn't just tweet it out to the universe. I picked about eight people into this? and direct message them. So I think my iPad died. Anybody, you know, I don't really want my text to get to know. 